I'm going to show you a, a video montage that I put together, but I just want to introduce it first. And uh, Claire's uh, repeating the comments of the Iranian cleric and MP about uh, they don't really want to have a bomb, but they need a bomb to put down Israel, um, as if it were a rabid dog, uh, uh, is, is a very uh, fitting segue to what I'm going to show you. Um, I, I used uh, photos, uh, texts, and clips uh, to depict how jihadism and canonical Islamic anti-Semitism motivate the relentless effort uh, to destroy the state of Israel. Okay, you're talking to that one. I want this one on the mic. Can you hear me better? Okay. Uh, featured prominently is an end of times messianic theme, which may be uh, familiar to some of you, uh, that's been reactivated with fervor in Islam for at least a century now, since the advent of the modern Zionist movement. Uh, uniquely Shiite uh, infidel impurity, so-called Najis uh, regulations, and their impact are also explored in the context of centuries uh, of Iranian theocratic rule. Uh, these motifs will be illustrated from the Sunni perspective, uh, by the following. Um, the founder of the Palestinian Arab Muslim Jihadist movement, uh, ex-Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajimin al Husani, via his 1937 proclamation seeking to galvanize the global Muslim Umar community for a jihad to annihilate Palestinian Jewry a decade before modern Israel came into existence. Uh, al Husani's proclamation, which some deemed a fatwa, hinged upon Quran 582, so the fifth surah or chapter, the 82nd verse, which declares that the Jews harbor inveterate hatred toward Muslims and the apocalyptic canonical tradition of Islam's prophet Muhammad that maintains that the messianic age will be ushered in by the annihilation of the Jews. Uh, copies of my uh, full analysis uh, are, are here. Uh, a repetition of this end of times canonical tradition of Jew annihilation 75 years later by the current Palestinian Authority Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Mohammed Hussein, during a January 9, 2012 sermon. Uh, a May 10, 2013 sermon by Sunni Islam's Vatican equivalent, uh, Al-Azhar University, uh, and its mosque uh, by Mohammed Al-Mahdi, a senior scholar and head of the Sharia Association at Al-Azhar, invoking both Quran 582 and this same canonical tradition of Jew annihilation. Uh, an October 25, 2013 interview by Sunni Islam's papal equivalent now, Al-Azhar Grand Imam Ahmed Al-Tayeb, also invoking Quran uh, 582. Uh, doctrinal Shiite jihadism and Islamic anti-Semitism in Iran, including the unique and dehumanizing impurity regulations, since the nation became a Shiite theocracy during the Safavid era, and that goes back to the beginning of the 16th century, are characterized next, past his prologue to our era and the current uh, Rouhani presidency. This material, the remainder and bulk of the presentation, includes a concise formulation of jihad by the jurist Al-Amili, and he died in 1621, description of the Najis and purity regulations by the Ayatollah Khomeini of his era, that was Al-Majlisi, who died in 1699, and this is from Majlisi's treatise fittingly named Lightning Bolts Against the Jews. Uh, the chronic uh, ugly uh, consequences of those regulations over centuries for Jews, in particular captured by the first-hand account of French observer Claude Annette uh, from 1905, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's statements on jihad, Jews and Jew annihilation, martyrdom and takia, which is the sacralized practice of dissimulation from 1942 to 1989, Statements sanctioning Israel's destruction by alleged moderate Iranian presidents Khatami, Rafsanjani, and Rouhani. The disturbing views on infidel impurity and Jew annihilation by much ballyhooed green movement inspiration, the late Ayatollah Ali Montazeri. A clear and forthright encapsulation of the Iranian regime's ideology vis-a-vis -vis Israel, again riveting on Quran 582 and Islamic messianism by uh, current Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei's representative in the Iranian Martyr Foundation, Mohammad Hassan Rahimian. And then finally, the poignant, uh, experientially wise observations of Iranian Jewish exile, Faraday Golden, who was born in 1953 and raised in the Shiraz uh, Jewish ghetto. So the first two are just stills of Hajimin el Hussani meeting with uh, Muslim recruits for the brigades he organized for the Nazis. In this case, uh, these are Azerbaijanis. It'll slowly fade to the next one. 
These are Bosnian Muslim recruits for the Nazis uh, that are reading his proclamation that I mentioned, his 1937 uh, proclamation. So there is a verse in the Quran which quite unmistakably characterizes the position of Islam and Judaism. It says, you will certainly find that the Jews and the idolaters harbor the strongest hostility toward those who believe. That's Quran 582. And this thought is even more strongly expressed in a statement of Muhammad. It will never be possible to see a Jew and a Muslim together without the Jew having a secret intent to destroy the Muslim. And then, he, then he goes on to this hadith. The day of judgment will only come when the Muslims have dealt the Jews a crushing blow, when every stone and every tree behind which a Jew has hidden speaks to the Muslim, behind me is a Jew, strike him dead. Only the tree Garkot, a small shrub with sharp thorns, will not take part, for it is a Jewish tree. <laughs> the Arabs have learned best how they really are. That is, as they, the Jews, are described in the Quran and in the sacred scriptures, the verses from the Quran and Hadith prove to you that the Jews have been the bitterest enemies of Islam and continue to, tr to try to destroy it. This is 1937. Fast forward 75 years. You probably won't hear it, but you can see it. <laughs> ففي صحيح الحديث وفي الصحيحين يقول لنا البخاري ومسلم لا تقوم الساعة حتى تقاتل اليهود فيختبئ اليهودي وراء الحجر أو الشجر فينادي الحجر أو الشجر يا مسلم يا عبد الله هذا يهودي ورائي تعالى فاطل إلا شجر الغرقد لذلك ليس عجيبا أن ترى الغرقد كان لا بد للأمة المسلمة وهي القائمة على الحق أن ترتبها إلى مؤامرات الباطل وإلى كيد الكائدين وقد علمهم ربهم عز وجل بأن أعداء أعدائهم هم الذين قال فيهم لتجدن أشد الناس عداوة للذين آمنوا اليهود والذين أشركوا ومن هنا كذلك ربط الله عز وجل بين الجهاد في سبيل الله وبذل المشقة وتحمل الأذى والصبر عليه وسيلة فعالة لمقاومة أهل الباطل واللقاء حتم مقضي فإن نبينا صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يكذب وهو صلى الله عليه وسلم أنبأنا بأنه لا بد أن يكون هناك لقاء بين المسلمين وبين اليهود قبل أن تقوم الساعة وأن المسلمين سينتصرون عليهم لدرجة أن يختبئوا وراء الحجر والشجر فيقول الحجر والشجر يا مسلم يا عبد الله هذا يهودي ورائي فاقتله استعدوا لهذا اليوم فإنه لا بد آت لأن الوحي لا يكذب أبدا القرآن في آية واحدة بيّن لي علاقة المسلمين باليهود والمشركين والمشركين في النص في المتصف بيّن علاقة المسيحيين بالمسلمين نعم. الجزء الثالث سبب او علل لماذا كان المسيحيون اقرب الناس مواده, مواده للمسلمين نعم. 
يبقى في تقرير وده موقف تاريخي ولن يتغير حتى الان يعني شوف احنا الان بنعاني ايه من الصهيونيه العالميه وهي يهوديه ونحن يعني بيننا تعايش سلمي اثبته التاريخ بيننا وبين المسيحيين ويعني شوف مضى على الاسلام 1400 سنه ونحن نعاني ايضا من التدخل اليهودي الصهيوني في شؤون المسلمين وفي يعني وبما يثير يعني متاعب كبرى للمسلمين. القران قالها والتاريخ يصدق نعم. ذلك. لا تجدن اشد الناس عداوه الذين امنوا اليهود والذين اشركوا. نعم. الجزء الاول. Okay. This is switching to Iran. This is the jurist Al Amili, a depiction of him. In his very straightforward discussion, Islamic holy war jihad against followers of other religions such as Jews is required unless they convert to Islam or pay the poll tax. This is the Khomeini equivalent, al-Majlisi. Uh, his treatise, Lightning Bolts Against the Jews, was actually an overall guideline to regulations for all Iran's non-Muslim dhimmis, Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians vanquished by jihad and forced to live under the Sharia as per Quran 929. He described the standard humiliating requisites of the Sharia for non-Muslims. First and foremost, the, the blood ransom jizya, or poll tax, again, based on Quran 929. He then enumerates six other restrictions relating to worship, housing, dress, transportation, and weapons, specifically to render the non-Muslims defenseless, before outlining the unique Shiite impurity, or so-called najis regulations. It is these latter Najis prohibitions which led anthropology professor Lawrence Loeb, who studied and lived within the Jewish community of southern Iran in the early 1970s, to observe the following. Fear of pollution by Jews led to great excesses and peculiar behavior by Muslims, unquote. According to al-Majlisi, this is quoting now, and that they, the dhimmis, should not enter the pool while a Muslim is bathing at the public baths. It is also incumbent upon Muslims that they should not accept from them, again the dhimmis, victuals, which with they had come into contact, such as distillates, which cannot be purified. If something can be purified, such as clothes, if they are dry, they can be accepted, they are clean. But if they, the dhimmis, had come into contact with those clothes in moisture, they should be rinsed with water after being obtained. It would also be better if the ruler of the Muslims would establish that all infidels could not move out of their homes on days when it rains or snows because they would make Muslims impure. And there are, there's, there are testimonies through the 1920s of Jews being beaten, sometimes beaten to death for going out in the rain. Far worse, the dehumanizing character of these popularized impurity regulations fomented recurring Muslim anti-Jewish violence, including pogroms and forced conversions throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, which rendered areas of Iran Judenrein, free of Jews, as opposed to merely unpleasant, odd behaviors by individual Muslims towards Jews. Claude Annette traveled through. Annette's uh, through Persia in a motor car, published an English translation, recorded his 1905 first-hand observations of the chronic plight of Iran's Jews under Iran's Qajar dynasty Shiite theocracy. And what you'll notice, I'll read you the statement, is the application of, of, of Najis regulations into the 20th century. 
Living in the midst of a fanatical and hostile population, Jews in Persia are reduced to the last extremity of degradation. Nearly all trades are forbidden to them. Everything they touch is considered defiled. There is very little justice in Persia for anybody. For the Jews, there is none at all. Every possible exaction is practiced on them. Nobody takes their part, and they live in appalling poverty, while their moral and physical degradation is beyond description. 1905. Islam is not a religion of pacifists. It's actually Ayatollah's 1942 statement on jihad. Those who study jihad will understand why Islam wants to conquer the whole world. All the countries conquered by Islam or to be conquered in the future will be marked for everlasting salvation, for they shall live under Allah's law. Islam says, kill the non-Muslims, put them to the sword, and scatter their armies. Islam says, whatever good there is exists thanks to the sword and in the shadow of the sword. People cannot be made obedient except with the sword. The sword is the key to paradise, which can be opened only for holy warriors, jihadists. There are hundreds of other Quranic Psalms and Hadiths, urging Muslims to value war and to fight. Does all that mean that Islam is a religion that prevents men from waging war? I spit upon those foolish souls who make such a claim. Those who know nothing of Islam pretend that Islam counsels against war. Those who say this are witless. From the very beginning, the historical movement of Islam has had to contend with the Jews, for it was they who first established anti-Islamic propaganda and engaged in various stratagems. And as you can see, this activity continues down to the present. Islam is prepared to subordinate individuals to the collective interest of society and has rooted out numerous groups that were a source of corruption and harm to human society. Since the Jews of Bani Qaraysa were a troublesome group causing corruption in, in Muslim society and damaging Islam and the Islamic State, the Most Noble Messenger eliminated them. If Muslims got together and each poured one bucket of water on Israel, a flood would wash Israel away. We do not worship Iran, Claire mentioned this, we worship Allah, for patriotism is another name for paganism. I say let this land burn, I say let this land go up in smoke, provided Islam emerges triumphant in the rest of the world. Islamic law exists to serve the interests of the Muslim community and of Islam. Therefore, to save Muslim lives and for the sake of Islam's survival, it is obligatory to lie. It is obligatory to drink wine if necessary. The moderate katami. If we abide by real legal laws, we should mobilize the whole Islamic world for, sh for sharp confrontation with the Zionist regime. If we abide by the Quran, all of us should mobilize to kill. the moderate Raf Sanjani. If one day the Islamic world is also equipped with weapons like those that Israel possesses now, then the imperial strategy will reach standstill because the use of even one nuclear bomb inside Israel will destroy everything. However, it will only harm the Islamic world. It is not irrational to contemplate such an eventuality. The current moderate president, Rouhani. This victory in the epic saga is without a doubt due to the special kindness of the Imam Mahdi and the measures taken by the supreme leader, especially his guidance and words. Without his management, then it was not clear if the people of Iran would witness such a day filled with joy. That's upon his election. and not long after. The Zionist regime has been a wound on the body of the Islamic world for years, and the wound should be removed. This is the moderate Montezeri, unfortunately. Najis is a political order from Islam and must be adhered to by the followers of Islam, and the goal is, is to promote general hatred toward those who are outside Muslim circles. al Sadiq affirmed thrice that those who will ultimately exterminate the Jews will be the clerics of Qom. This is the regime, Muhammad Hassan Rahimian. Excuse me, he's, a, he's in the Iranian Martyr Foundation.
The Jew is the most obstinate enemy, Quran 582, of the devout, and the main war will determine the destiny of mankind. The reappearance of the 12th Imam will lead to a war between Israel and the Shia. Here's a clip. Al Hassar al Ikhtisadi wa kul ma amilu alayna la yahibu al makru sayyi illa bi ahli. Yani, natijatu sar bil aks. يعني الآن إذا نحن في أبل الحرب ما كان عندنا أي شيء من تجهيزات الحربية نحن صنعنا صواريخ يمكن يمكن عند الاقتضاء أن نبدل كل إسرائيل بمحرقة كبيرة. Faraday Goldman now teaches at Old Dominion University. She's an Iranian Jewish refugee. She was actually contemplating a trip to Iran back in late 2005. Visiting Iran for the last time in the summer of 1976, I vowed never to return. But during the last few years, the temptation slowly crept into me like a long-abandoned addiction. My husband has never visited the country of my birth. We had planned to spend a year in Iran after he finished his medical internship. A medical conference in Mashhad seemed to be my best chance to introduce my husband to my first homeland. I made the decision to go with much trepidation, however. I am a woman. I am Jewish. I am a writer. Each category subjected me to discrimination and suspicion. That was October 21, 2005. Barely a week later, Iran was in the headlines. Its president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, called for the destruction of the state of Israel. Every man, woman, and child, artist, farmer, scientist, grocer, the young girl whose parents walked from Yemen, my friend who was carried out of Syria in her father's arms, screaming from hunger, the young man from Ethiopia who left everything behind, and yes, my mother, father, and sister too. What are they to this fanatic leader but a small price to pay on the road to heavenly redemption? How could I go back to Iran? I mourn for my parents' loss of dignity, for all the Iranian Jewish refugees still numb with the political earthquake that tumbled their lives. The hands of evil are strong and long, seeking them still, not with daggers and clubs, as when my parents and grandparents lived in the dark ghettos of Iran, when Jew haters encouraged by fanatical mullahs rampaged through their meager belongings, but now with missiles and atomic bombs.